we'll make a make a start um now um and i'd like to welcome you all to um today's webinar on the safe and effective uh, use of sheep uh, sheep dip op sheep dips and sheep dipping um and scott's group as well as is, is pleased to be able to share with you today some of the important updates on the cross industry code of practice for mobile sheep dipping and the prescribing process um just some housekeeping um we <laughs> someone's already on the ball um we've got uh, the two two boxes down the bottom we've got chat and and q and a if you have questions um, for the panelists, we'll pick them up as we go when we feel it's the, the best time to take them um, or, and we'll do most of them at the end. Um, we also have a, a, a chat box. Um, if you are here today to gain Amtra and Rosa points, um, please put your number in the chat so Joe can put them up there. Um, and then we're going to ask you to put them on um again toward uh, towards the end sometime and ask you to put them in again so we know you've been here all the way through and i will be changing my ties as we go through the webinar and i might ask you how many ties i've worn just to make sure you've been <laughs> in all the way along so yeah i think vetpo also registered but i think they're pointing slightly different um but yeah any questions and uh, and uh, uh to go to the panelists please please put it in the in the question and answers so we can pick them up and get them around the panelists a bit easier now i'm just going to read you the opening paragraph from uh, from the mobile dipping code of practice and sheep dipping must be carried out professionally and must comply with all relevant legislation to safeguard animal welfare human health and the environment it is also vital to minimize the risk of resistance developing in sheep scab mites to, organoph to organophosphates. This guidance has been produced to remind farmers, contractors, and prescribers of their responsibilities. It is essential to work as a team so that scab can be controlled effectively and the OP dip is prescribed, stored, used, and disposed of safely. If we do that, we will have it for future years to come and hopefully keep get on top of what is a nasty parasite. Um, this has the backing of the whole industry, and that is reflected in those talking to you today, from the manufacturer down to the end user. These include myself, Kevin Harrison, I'm the chair of SCOPS, and also a sheep farmer down in the West Country. We have Leslie Stubbins, who does a great deal of work for SCOPS, and is an independent sheep consultant, nutritionist as well. We also have Stephen Dawson from AMTRA, which is the Animal Medicine Training Regulatory Authority, we have Brian Lovegrove from ARDA, which is the Animal Health Distributors Association. We have Jill Hewitt from the National Association of Agricultural Contractors, which is the NAAC. And we have Rachel Mallet from Biomeda. So I'm going to hand over now, I believe, to Leslie to start. Um, I'd like to welcome all our panellists and, um, and I look forward to enjoying your presentations. Thanks, Kevin, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, we're all probably hiding from the heat at the moment, so uh, it's quite nice to be in the cool. So I just want to give a bit of an introduction, really, a little bit of background about sheep scab and really sort of answer the two main questions as to why have we done this code? Why have we updated it now? Um, and, and specifically, why now? Why is it so important that we do that? Um, so, you know, just a reminder that obviously this is largely I'm talking about sheep scab. Sheep scab has been a scourge of the sheep industry in the UK for centuries, not just uh, in living memory. If you go back as far as the abbeys that formed most of our wealth in many, many, many years ago, um, sheep scab was what brought one or two of them down. And when they got sheep scab, all of their wealth was based on wool. So it goes back a long way. Um, and I'm not going to go into the disease itself this afternoon because there's plenty of stuff on the SCOPS website. We want to talk about the code of practice and the why. Um, but if you do want to know more about the disease, then, then do go and have a look um, on the SCOPS website and on the Biomeda website as well, of course, where there's a lot of information. So if we just move on now and, and have a look at, you know, where are we? What are the current stats in terms of sheep scab? If we just have the next, thanks, Joe. Um, then 
just to sort of put this into perspective, of course, we had deregulation back in the early 90s. We, um, some of you um, will remember the compulsory dipping that stopped in the early 90s. And since then, the number of cases of sheep scab has gone up. And the general feeling is that there's about eight to 10,000 outbreaks a year in the UK. And generally, people have been quoting that sort of figure for a while. And they say that probably about 10 to 15 percent of sheep in the UK are affected in any one year. Now, what we do know is because we've been working quite a lot on scab in the last couple of years um, through the RDPE project, the For Flock's Sake project, which I'm sure many of you have, have heard us talking about, we do know that that's not quite the tip of the iceberg, but it isn't the whole story. If you look at those air red areas, those in those very highly affected areas, the common theme is common grazing because it's quite difficult to control a disease, a parasite like scab, where you've got mixing and contact of sheep between flocks on common grazing. Um, but with the projects we've been doing using the blood test, it's quite obvious that those flocks where we see clinical signs are not the only affected flocks. There are a lot of flocks that are also carrying sheep scab at almost a subclinical or even a subclinical level. Um, that have been habitually infested, they've been infested for a long time. They don't no longer, hardly ever show any clinical signs, but they're infected. So we know basically that the eight to 10,000 outbreaks is not the whole story. There's a lot more out there. And we revised the cost as well recently. Um, due to the modeling work that we had and updating costs, we reckon it's costing up to about 200 million pounds a year to the industry. Um, so it's, it's not insignificant. Now, if we think about next where we are in terms of treatments for sheep scab, so we only have two, and I know many of you on this call are going to be SQPs, um, and you only really have two um, arrows in your quiver, really. One are the injectable ME, uh, MLs, and the other one, of course, a plunge dip in OP. And it's the plunge dip that we're going to talk about a lot today. We do also have um, best practice guidance on the website and the use of MLs as well. So that's another area that you can go and have a look at um, if you want some best practice advice on that. But we do only have the two. And, you know, the, the MLs came in in the sort of mid 90s. And this 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 diagram here is some data that I was given. It's it's not absolutely accurate. It's based on we tried to turn sales into roughly sort of treatments and then percentage of treatments. But it gives you a really good idea of what's been going on since the deregulation. So in the early 90s, we didn't have injectables. We only had dips. We had the OP dip and we had SP dip and the old the SP dips of course have gone. Um, they went in the early two in the early noughties um, because they were they had resistance. We had resistance building to flumethrin particularly, and also they were extremely harmful to the environment. Um, unlike an OP, which once it hits organic material, it starts to denature very quickly. The SPs were very persistent in the environment, so we lost those. But you can see there that most of the treatments were OP in the early 90s. They were dipping in OP. And then as the indecticides, the red bars came in, you can see how really they took off through the 90s, through the noughties, up to the point where there in 2017, um, the difference between indecticides and OP is is huge. You know, OP is down to 10% or less of treatments and the indecticides are up there. Um, around about the 40%. And of course, the other we're talking in here, we've got um, porons for blowfly as well. So it takes all ectoparasites in there. And the problem was that there are two issues, the two resistance issues. One is that all of that indecticide use, as you know, I'm sure, um, also puts pressure on roundworms for resistance. That was a concern. But in about 2017, we had the first reports, confirmed reports of resistance to the indecticides in sheep scab bites. And that really started to concentrate the mind. It's when we all started talking about codes of practice, about what we could do, about the sorts of projects that are going on around the country now, because we could see that we were going to need to, um, if you like, revert back to using more OP. So 
just thinking about that and, and what are the requirements for an OP to be used properly, if we could just move to the next one, Joe. That great, thank you. Um, you know, one of the good things we found out very recently, and, and Rachel will be able to comment on this later as well, is that we had to answer the question, well, if you've got scab mites that are resistant to MLs, will an OP kill them? And we can categorically tell you that the answer is yes. That work has been done by the more done in conjunction with Bimeda. Um, and we can say that if you have got resistant mites on a farm, providing you use the OP exactly as we're going to describe today, you will kill those resistant mites. So that is the good news. The question then is how do we use, sorry Joe, can you just go back please? The question is how do we actually use, no back, back thanks, the OP properly? And the key to this is to make sure that we expose those mites absolutely as effectively as possible, 100% kill. And if you just look at this picture here, we've got um, a lesion and the scab mites are on the outer edges of a lesion usually. They're underneath those crusty bits. They don't actually puncture the skin, but they're under there and they're feeding off things that are on the surface of the skin. And in order to kill them, we have to get the OP down to the skin and we have to get it down to the skin for long enough and all over the sheep to be able to kill them. If we don't do that, we're not going to get an effective kill. But the real danger is that we will be speeding up our journey towards resistance in the OPs. And we know we don't know have any cases in the UK at the moment, but we do know that it's perfectly possible because we have reported cases in um, South America, for example, where we know it is possible. So we've got to be so careful because these are only our last form of defence our last form of defence. Okay, thanks. Move on now. So that's why we will keep hammering and hammering and hammering about the fact that these, that OP must not be used either through a shower or a jetter because neither of those gets the OP down to the skin to the point where it is going to be effective, effectively killing scab mites. And, and, and it is actually, uh, you know, it's an off license use. It's not licensed for that use and therefore it's not legal for that use, either to provide it for that use or to use it. Um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot more pressure on that because not because everyone's wanting to be awkward, but because people are really worried. We need to keep the OPs working. Um, so we, you'll see quite a lot of, you know, the take the plunge stuff. OK, and my final slide, I think. So just introducing now, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues now. We're going to talk about the code of, of practice. You know, a lot of farmers now don't have the facilities anymore on farm. It's expensive disposal. You know, you've got to be so careful where you site dipping. So understandably, they are um, looking towards professional mobile dippers to do the job for them. And that is really what this code is about. A lot of the things are applicable to anybody, of course, but this is to do with those farmers who want to dip and I want to make sure that they're getting a professional job done and it's effective, it's safe from a human point of view and also it's safe from an environmental point of view. So I'll hand over now um, to Stephen I believe um, and, and Stephen and Brian and Rachel and Jill will take you through more of the detail of what this code of practice actually is. Thank you. Uh, thanks Leslie. Um... Final uh, reminder to anyone who was maybe a couple of minutes late, if you haven't already gone into the chat and you're looking for Amtra or Rosa points, please do so now and uh, include your name and your number. Otherwise, we won't know you're here. Thank you. Um, right. So just uh, as, as a reminder, um, those of you who are SQPs in, in, in the audience will know fine well that OP sheep dips, they're authorised veterinary medicines, they're prescription only medicines. And that uh, is, is part of the challenge that, that, that we had in, in coming up with this code of practice. Um, there's legal requirements in, in respect of, uh, of, of all veterinary medicines uh, and, and these as prescription only medicines. Uh, and there's a requirement because of their status. They're not just chemicals. Uh, they're serious chemicals in this instance, but they have to be prescribed and supplied according to the veterinary medicines regulations uh, and consistent with the label. Um, and those of you who are prescribers uh, will know that 
you can only prescribe uh, when you're confident that they're going to be used lawfully. So in particular, in this case, uh, that they're going to be used as plunge dips. So uh, that's something you might hear several times over the course of this session. Uh, we are quite clear that we're talking about the use of these OP sheep dips as plunge dips, not showers and jetters. If they're going to be used as showers and jetters, then that, as Leslie says, is uh, uh, illegal for their use in that way. But it's also not uh, permitted for prescribers to prescribe them in that way. So there's, there's two ways in which that's not permitted, if you see what I mean. So next slide, please, Joe. Um, animal medicines prescribing. Um, the law imposes duties on those of you who are, who are prescribers. And it says uh, the, the, the set of information you need to gain from the farmer to make a decision that you're going to prescribe. And also uh, there are certain duties on you in terms of the information that you need to give to the farmer about how to use the medicine safely, so that it's going to be effective, so that the environment is protected afterwards in terms of handling of the stock, so that human safety is protected, all those sorts of things. For, for, for any uh, veterinary medicine, those are, those are part of the prescribing and supply process. It also requires that prescription must be for a particular group of animals. Now, the challenge in the case of mobile dipping and contractor dipping, which is which is the, the, the core of what we're talking about and, and, and is what the code of practice that we're talking about today, is that the contractor, if you like, as an intermediary, I think it's quite helpful in some ways to think of them in that sense, isn't well handled by that setup and by the regu by the expectation of the regulations. And because we're talking about prescription for particular uh, groups of animals, nor is bulk purchasing. Um, now, we're all well aware that this has been happening in the past, um, and the challenge has been how to come up with a practical way in which what we, what we as uh, prescribers and farmers and contractors all collectively do um, can be done uh, consistent with the, the, the letter and the spirit of the regulations and respects the fact that these are prescription only medicines and they're serious chemicals and so on. So that's what we think we've achieved with this code of practice. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Joe. Um, so I, I think there are, there, there are three audiences, if you like. Uh, and in one sense, the most obvious audience is the contract dippers themselves. And the code of practice clarifies their responsibilities and sets out what is good practice in terms of handling the, the medicine, the dip itself, handling the dipping process, handling the spent dip wash afterwards. It talks about the responsibility of the contractors in terms of how they interact with prescribers and their role and responsibility as an intermediary. So the things that would normally be done between a prescriber an SQP or, or a pharmacist or a vet where, that, where that's happening, between the prescriber and the farmer, but in, in this instance, we've got the contract dippers acting as an intermediary. So the, again, the code of practice sets out their responsibilities uh, in terms of the, the information they need to make sure reaches the prescriber and the information they need to make sure reaches the farmer. But also, questions that they need to make sure the farmer uh, is equipped to answer in terms of uh, use of other products, uh, the Vamisols in particular, uh, thinking about the health of the sheep um, and other things that would normally be a direct interaction between the prescriber and the farmer. And the what's in it for me, if you like, as far as the contract differs are concerned, is this is the way in which they can legitimately get hold of seven days consecutive supply in advance. Without complying with this code of practice, then the contract dippers cannot get hold of uh, supply in advance. So, so that's the what's in it for them. So the next slide, please, Joe. Um, to farmers, um, I guess my message is first be aware that this code exists um, and to be, if, if you are using contract dippers, then you should be using contract dippers who are confirming that they're complying with this code. But also be aware, farmers, of the resistance problems that are already associated with the injectables um, and consider OP plunge dipping, there's that uh, phrase again, professionally administered. 
Um, I said use contractors who confirm they're following this code. Uh, and to farmers, be aware of the risks of cutting corners. Um, you're getting poor treatment efficacy. They do not work if you don't do it properly. You're risking resistance both in your own stock and for the, the, the wider industry. And if they're not working well, you're wasting money. So doing it right is, is the way to go forwards. And the next slide, please, Joe. Uh, so the third of the audiences, uh, and Brian's going to come in in a moment and, and add some more detail for, for this audience, but prescribers. Um, so that's uh, mostly SQPs, registered animal medicines advisors, but, but, in, but in principle, it's also pharmacists and vets who are, who are, are involved in prescribing OP dips. And the, 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 the first message to you, Brian's got some other messages, but the first message uh, to you is if you're going to supply up to seven consecutive days of supply in advance, then the expectation, the requirement, if you like, from AMTRA is that this dipping code of practice is followed by you and by the contractors. And you must prescribe and supply only for individual farms if that is not happening. So if, you, if, if the code of practice, this dipping code of practice, is not being followed by the contractor or they're not confirming that they're following it, then you must be only prescribing and supplying for individual farms and not supplying uh, bulk amounts for, for future use. Of course, you can still prescribe and supply as previously to individual farmers um, if meeting the requirements that, that we've always had in, in, in terms of the SQP code of practice. Um, but I think that last um, is probably going to continue to decline as farmers recognise that their, their their facilities are tired and worn out and, and, and maybe don't exist anymore. And those who are, are now increasingly suffering problems with resistance to the MLs, if they want to turn to OP dips, then professional contractors following this code of practice is our preferred way forward. So, Brian, do you want to add a bit more detail? Thank you, Stephen. And um, I concur with all the previous speakers on this subject. Um, over the years, we've seen a change in plunge dipping on farms. Mainly uh, 20, 25 years ago, farmers had their own plunge dip facilities. Along came the ML injectables. But now when we see the resistance building up with the injectables, we're now turning back uh, to plunge dipping as a way of combating uh, sheep scab. Many of the farms 25 years ago filled in their sheep dip uh, and covered them over. So now they're turning to, to contractors. And it's something that we would encourage. We can see the contractors filling a very useful role in the eradication, potential eradication of, of sheep dip across the UK. So I re re reiterate again that OP sheep dip is plunge dip, uh, only licensed for plunge dipping and not licensed for showers and jetters. So when we're looking at prescribing, we should be always looking for the certificate of competence. And with this uh, code of practice, we're asking everybody to do, even though you may have seen the certificate of competence in the past, or somebody refers to a number, that for the first time when you're dealing with a contractor or even a farmer, you ask for a copy of that certificate of competence. If they say they've lost it, Copies are available from City and Guilds who, uh, who are overarching on the MPTC. So you, if you have got a certificate of competence that may be several years old and can't find it, well, then you can ask for a copy. The, uh, the, uh, the certificate of competence has been updated to recognise the change in regulations um, and uh, anybody new taking it um, will see the changes to that uh, certificate. As Stephen has already said, uh, to try and get around the situation of no bulk purchase or bulk storage by contractors, we're tr still trying to encourage the use of contractors across the UK. And so where a prescriber, and particularly an SQP, who gives a verbal or oral prescription at the moment, will now need to fill out a prescription for each farm that the contractor is going to be visiting. For that, they'll need their, I'll come on to the, the, the details of it, some of their personal information, but you, that can be explained to the farmer that it is for the purpose of getting a prescription. There's no GDPR issues at all. It's just so that the prescriber is going through the proper protocol and the sheep dip contractor is going through the proper protocol as well. So they can, a uh, contractor can get 
up to seven days, consecutive days, uh, sheep dip material to do a, a week's work. Quite likely that they'll be going back to the same prescriber um, for several weeks in a row, depending on where they are in the country. The prescription is still for to a farm or a group of animals um, and then requires some details of the farms to be recorded. So if we go to the next slide, please, Joe. So what we're going to be looking for, um, the farm details and date dipping is planned. The reason for dipping, and I'll come on to that again in a minute when I show you the, the example of the form that we'll be using, the number of sheep to be dipped, the amount of OP prescribed, uh, as you all know as prescribers, the amount of dip prescribed can depend on, but will depend on the tank size that the, the contractor is using to get the right concentration and the number of sheep because the, the, the OP gets weaker as the more sheep are dipped. Confirmation that the farmer has been warned, like Stephen said, about the use of yellow drenches within 14 days of dipping. And then when we've got a total amount for up to seven days, a contractor might do one or two farms uh, in any particular day, but the total number for each day will be calculated of, of material that they'll need. And then the total for seven days will then be added up and then supplied to the contractor. So a suggested form that's in the uh, in the code uh, of code, code of practice there's an example here and i've just asked joe to click on the exact exact um, form that you'll be seeing as part of the code of practice so we'll go down as you'll see here this is just an example that, of the information that you'll be asking for so if you just go up or down here, here we go so here you record just go slightly up a bit please joe Whoop, there. so the prescribers details and the contractor's details and then slide down again so then we've got a list of things of information that you need to be completing so on the first day there may be one or two farmers names and addresses in there their cph number the reason for dipping um and, and then if we just so there's a number of questions we like to ask but if you just slide down at the bottom and then signed off just hold it there joe so it's signed off by the prescriber and signed off by the contractor and the contractor is signing off that they are not acknowledging that they're working to the content and the details within this code of practice. Um, and then there's many reasons for dipping. And the, the, here we have some codes available that you just put in the, the different against each farm for why you're actually carrying out that dipping process. So this is the way that contractors will now need to use it to enable them to be supplied with up to seven days worth of OP dip. If for any reason, through bad weather or circumstances change with the contract or the farmer, when they next go into that prescriber, they would need to make sure they inform the prscriber of that change of circumstances and the, and the dipping schedule may, might have changed. So, and I think that's the end of my presentation. So we'll be going on then to uh, Rachel and Bymeda. Thank you. Can I just, uh, it might be worth just asking this question whilst it's up, Brian. Um, yep. At the end of yours, and that was from Harry, and it says, is there a fresher course for certificate holders? Um, I don't think whether there's a, whether there's a refresher course, uh, Kevin, I think, but they can take the course again completely if they wanted to. Yeah. And um, there's, um, there's, no, there's no requirement for any one with a certificate of competence to do it. No, we uh, Going back a few months now, we did talk about having um, a lifespan for the certificate of competence of, say, five years, and then a refresher course to keep it updated and maintained. But sitting guilds didn't go with that. So anybody that's got a current certificate of competence, that is still valid. Um, and like I said, we can get a copy if they need to from sitting guilds. Uh, but if anybody's unsure of their, whether they're... Uh, whether it's their father or their grandfather that may have taken the certificate of competence, anybody can go and have a, a new course and go through the whole process again and get a new certificate of competence. Thank you. So, Rachel. Lovely. Thank you, Brian. So, um, just on this end, I would like to run through a little bit about best practice for dipping. Now, of course, we focused very much on contractors today. The purpose of covering good dipping technique is really so that you can identify what good dipping technique looks like if you are utilising a contractor. But I'm also conscious that there may be people on the call who will themselves dip. And so I'd like to just review what composes good dipping technique. 
Now, I will cover the, the key points here. If this is something that anyone has any additional requirements on or would like extra training, please feel free to reach out to Bymeda afterwards. So we've talked already about the Certificate of Competence. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. For that Certificate of Competence, one person involved in the dipping process must have it. Say, for example, there's a group of you, say three of you, all going to help out with the dipping process that day. The one person who has the certificate is in charge of the operation. They're responsible for everyone involved safety, the safety and well-being of the animals that are being dipped, and also in charge of fulfilling the environmental responsibilities. So as we've alluded to, training courses are available. And as Brian said, there's nothing to stop you redoing it if you feel that it was a long time ago that you completed this qualification and you would like a refresher to get up to speed again. That's absolutely fine. Next slide, please. So when it comes to disposal of used dip, this is of immense importance. We know that because dip is a harmful chemical, if it's disposed of incorrectly, then it will have a negative impact on the environment and on water quality. Now, it's worth being aware that across the different devolved nations, there are different requirements when it comes to the safe disposal of used sheep dip. Broadly speaking, there are two options. One is disposal to land, and if that's something that you're interested to explore further, you should reach out directly to the appropriate devolved environment agency, all of which I have included on the screen below. It is also an option to use a waste, um, a waste disposal company to responsibly dispose of dip. Now, what I would say is that not all companies are capable of handling and disposing used sheep dip. So if this is a route that you would like to go down, then make sure that you have those arrangements in place ahead of dipping and that you know exactly what will happen with that waste dip and in what time frame. Because we have seen that occasionally people think that it's going to be fairly easy to dispose of to find that actually there aren't any facilities nearby that can handle that waste. So well organised, you want to know what you're doing with that waste well before you start dipping those animals. Next slide, please. Now, the, the one big thing, if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from today, it's your own safety is absolutely paramount. We know that organophosphates are harmful to human health if you're inappropriately exposed to them. So your personal protective equipment is of the utmost importance. Now, when it comes to that personal protective equipment, essentially, we want to be head to toe in waterproofs. Those waterproofs, the material of them is very important. Now, I know that we quite often use the breathable waterproofs around the farm. Fantastic for almost every job that you do. But when it comes to dipping, unfortunately, they're not suitable. The breathable nature of them means that there's a potential for you to become exposed to dip concentrate. And so we need you to use either PVC or nitrile. And we would always recommend that there's a spare set of waterproofs available on the day of dipping in case they end up getting ripped or damaged or even contaminated if an accident does happen. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to um, preparing your dip bath, we want to make sure that we get going on the best foot to get the best out of the dipping process. So what you can see in the top right hand side here is the dispensing kit. And this dispensing kit is a closed transfer system that will allow you to transfer dip concentrate into the bath without coming directly into contact with that concentrate. So again, of critical importance for your own safety. Now, our dipping tank has to be completely clean. We don't want any residues from last time, any sort of fecal or organic material within that bath, because those things will impact the results that you get from your dip. We need to know the volume of water that your tank holds, and you have to have a way like a calibrated stick or a specific marker that tells you where to fill it to. Now, the ratio for initial mixing is 600 mils of gold fleece to 900 litres of water. At the very end, I'm going to show you a link to our website. On that website, we do have a handy guide which you can download, and it shows examples for different sizes of bath to explain not only what your initial starting concentrations are, but also the appropriate intervals for topping up the bath and how much you would top them up by. Next slide, please. So the way in which dip works is something that I'd like to touch on today. 
essentially when we place a sheep into that dip bath, the dip compound, the diazonon, will bind directly to the wool grease or the lanolin. So this is why we have to have a couple of centimetres of wool on them, because if they don't have any wool at the time of dipping, there's no wool grease for that diazonon to stick to. So essentially, the more sheep that we put through the bath, the more diazonon that's absorbed and then subsequently removed from the bath. Next slide, please. So if we have a look, um, my graph has gone a little bit skew with here, uh, but essentially the first sheep that we put in the bath, it's at its highest concentration at that point in time. And you can see that as more sheep pass through the bath, the concentration begins to drop as they take that diazonon out in their wool grease. Now, of course, we top up at regular intervals as described in the data sheet and on the can, but you'll notice that it never gets quite back up to its original level. And the reason for that is that dip is degraded by organic material. So for example, feces, wool that's left behind, urine, soil, they're all gonna contaminate your bath and start to reduce the efficacy of it. So there is a maximum number of sheep that we can put through a bath before we have to empty out and start completely from scratch again. And the rule for that is that it's one, one sheep to every two litres of dip wash. So say you have a 1,000 litre bath, you would empty and clean out after 500 sheep have passed through. Equally a 2,000 litre bath, you would empty out and start fresh again after 1,000 sheep have passed through. Now what I would say is that that's under normal circumstances. We would like you to put sheep through the bath as clean as possible. But if you do note that it becomes overly contaminated before that threshold, you should start fresh again to make sure that you get the best from the product. And the critical thing is that we never fall below that minimum effective concentration by topping up at the correct interval. And you can see my line for the minimum effective concentration has gone a little bit stray here, but it's around 100 mark. So um, essentially, if you don't empty out once the bath reaches its threshold, you will go below your minimum effective concentration and you won't get the appropriate lifespan out of that dip it may not even be sufficient to take care of the parasites in the first instance. Next slide, please. So when it comes to topping up, I have put the guidelines on the screen here. Now, I won't go through these in too much detail. I know the numbers are a little bit um, tedious to talk through, but essentially be aware that there are different parameters depending on the size of your bath. Our topping up guide on the website does cover that but your baths of less than 2,250 litres, you must top them up after every 36 sheep, and you'll do that by adding 180 mils, which equates to three pumps of 60 mils from your dispensing kit. For your larger baths, it's after every 96 sheep that we top them up, and we do that by delivering eight pumps of 60 mils from the dispensing kit, which equates to a total of 480 mils. And what I would say is that we know that um, dipping sheep is hard work. It's easy to um, lose track of the numbers that you're putting through. So I find that the little clicker devices that count the number of animals passing through are critical. Now, we've covered quite a bit on replenishment and topping up and when to empty out. The other thing that I would point out on this, a question that comes up occasionally is around the storage of dip. Now, we never recommend storing dip to reuse, even if it does, in theory, have the capacity for it, because there's nothing within dip wash to prevent bacterial growth. So essentially, you put animals at risk of bacterial infection if you keep dip wash. And of course, if you're moving between different premises, you can never reuse that dip elsewhere because that presents a significant biosecurity hazard. Next slide, please. Now, there are things that you can do to prepare sheep for passing through the bath. So essentially, we would like them to go in as clean as possible. So if they've got dirty back ends, if we could dag or crutch them before they enter the bath, that's important not just to keep your bath clean, but also to get the most from these products, especially when it comes to things like fly strike, because we know that dirty back ends reduce the way that fly prevention products work. If they're overly muddy on the feet, we can get them to walk through a shallow foot bath of water. But remember that they have to go into the bath with a completely dry fleece in order to absorb the maximum amount of dip wash. There are animals that will also need extra support through the baths. 
So, um, for example, lambs, any fat sheep, any pregnant ewes, they're all going to need a little bit of extra support. And we don't want to dip them if they're overly tired, overly thirsty. We need to make sure that they've got something to drink in the run-up to dipping. Next slide, please. Now, just to touch back to dirty dip wash, if we do have overly dirty dip wash, then we can see a condition known as post-dipping lameness. And post-dipping lameness is associated with bacterial contamination of your dip wash. It's animals that go into the bath with existing foot wounds. They're then exposed to bacterial contamination and it increases the risk of infections entering those wounds. And generally you'll see them two to three days after they've been through the dip wash. So again, we want to do everything that we can to keep that dip wash as clean as possible. And we never want to leave the dip wash sitting to use again at a later day or the following day because it allows the chance for bacteria to proliferate. Next slide, please. So for dipping to be effective, animals must remain in for a full minute and they must have their head dipped under the surface twice. Now the head has to go under the surface because the sheep scab mites do have the ability to survive within the ear canal. And if we miss that population of mites within the ear canal, potentially they'll be able to resurface at a later date beyond the protection period of the product and then recolonize or reinfect the host again. Next slide, please. And just to touch more on that one minute situation. So I often get the question, if we make the bath twice as concentrated and keep them in half the time, is it not just the same thing? And obviously I wish it was, it would make your life much easier. I appreciate that. But the reality is there's no way around the 60 seconds. It's a time dependent thing, how much dip is absorbed into the wool grease. So you can see that if you only leave them in the bath for 20 seconds, then you're only going to end up with half as much dip in that wool. Now, dipping, we all know it's hard work. If you're going through the process but not keeping them in for the appropriate amount of time, you're essentially not getting the most from that product. And we know that if you don't keep them in the full 60 seconds, there's a 60% chance that you will fail to cure sheep scab infection. Next slide, please. Now, after we've dipped them, we also have to consider that these animals now have fleeces, which are full of organophosphate. So they must spend time in the drain pen with that drain pen draining back into the dipping tank for safe disposal. Now, it's a minimum of five minutes, sometimes takes up to 10 minutes, but we want to keep them there until we can see that there are visibly no residues of dip dripping off of their fleece. Also remember that the area that you've held them or areas that they pass through immediately after will likely have some organophosphate contamination from shaking, for example. So bear that in mind in regards to your own safety and the safety of the environment. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we can't shear them for three months after we dip them. It would be a hazard to the person handling and shearing them. And we also have to make sure that we don't use levamazole, so your group two wormers, either 14 days before or 14 days after we dip them. The reason for that is that they work on the same receptors and so you may potentially get signs of organophosphate toxicity if you use those two products too close to each other. And this is something which contractors will now ask you at the time of booking if your animals have either had that product recently or whether you're planning to use it in or around the time of dipping. Next slide, please. Now, I know I've talked plenty about showering today, but it's so important that I am going to emphasise it one final time. Gold fleece or no other dip is licensed for use in showers or jetters. We don't know that it works. It's a risk to the environment. There's a human health concern in that potentially the aerosols they produce could be inhaled. We know that the product just does not penetrate the fleece down to skin level you never end up with the same amount of diazinon concentration within the fleece. So don't do it. But critically, we're super worried that showering and jetting will lead to the emergence of resistance. So please, please do not do it. And if you've got any concerns about anyone showering or jetting, reach out to any of the speakers on this call or their organisations. We're all here to help and can advise on the steps that you can take. Next slide, please. 
So at this point, I will hand over to Jill and happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel, whilst Jill's getting ready, can I just ask yes. you a question that's come in here? Um, how many sheep would you need to put through the solution for it to be safe to put into a slurry lagoon as dirty water? As following the graph, it will get to naught at a point. So th theoretically, yes, it will get to naught at a point, but there are so many factors that define where that will happen related to the, the level of organic contamination. But the reality is that the law doesn't see it that way and the environmental protection agencies, they do not see it that way. So regardless of the diaz and on concentrate, this is still used cheap dip, even if in theory it contains zero after a period of weeks. So um, it still must be disposed of in accordance with the requirements from the stated environment agencies. Thank you. And it wouldn't be used in accordance with the guidance. Kevin, can I just say one other point as well? We've mentioned uh, showers and jetters several times, um, but if any prescriber or farmer is aware of contractors or farmers who are using showers or jetters. They need reporting so that that practice can be stopped as soon as possible. So any of the organisations on this call today or to the VMD anonymously, if you like, to report bad practice so we can stamp out and eliminate those showers and jetters being used. Thank you. Right. Okay, sorry to stop you there, Jill. That's all right. I'm ready, Kevin. Go. Um, Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm here, I, I suppose, to talk about the professional contractor um, and particularly from the farmer's point of view, what to look for when selecting a contractor. For fear of repeat, repeating everything that everybody's already said today, which I feel like I might be going to do, um, I think these points are still quite important. So, so the one thing that's not on here that has been repeated uh, numerous times today is the contractor must be aware and following this code of practice that we're all talking about. They should have a copy and they should know what's in it. They should also um, be providing the farmer with the appropriate record keeping after, um, after they've done the dipping and have all the, the relevant uh, forms for the supply of dip from the prescriber. So when selecting a contractor, they need to be properly insured, um, which means public liability. And if they've got employers, they need employers liability insurance. And that is worth checking because if anything goes wrong, um, a mate doing some work for you could go horribly wrong. Um, they need to have uh, sufficient the, the appropriate skills and training, as we've already talked about today. That's the MPTC Safe Use of Sheep Dip qualification. Um, and the necess necessary certificate of competence, which they should be able to supply. It's worth checking if they're going to use any subcontractors um, just to make sure that all those same, uh, that they have the same qualifications available. Before you start dipping, you need to agree responsibility for dip disposal and any waste disposal. That needs agreement and it needs a clear plan in place to make sure that dip is disposed of responsibly. Um, as I've said before, need to check that the records will be kept and that duplicates will be provided um, and the farmer has all the necessary information once the contractor leaves. I'm going to repeat it again, even though everybody's already said it. You cannot use a mobile dipper that is using a shower or jetter. That is illegal. So they must be using a plunge dip. Um, and there are different varieties available, but that, that's really important, as everybody else has said. As, as with any contractor, price is always an issue, um, but certainly look at costings. If it, if it seems very cheap, there's probably a reason. You usually get what you pay for. If you're unsure about costs and what your sheep dip contractor should be charging, um, the NAC provides annual costs and annual, a guide price for contracting, which covers all sorts of contracting, but sheep dipping is certainly within that. Um, and just remember, as everybody else has talked about, the contractor must be safe and make sure that that use of dip is effective. On to the next slide, please. In, in terms of how to find a contractor, um, the NAAC website is a good place to start. You can search on there for um, a sheep dipping contractor, or if you need any more help, um, feel free to get in touch with us at the office. Um, and I think Rachel's going to tell you a little bit more as well as to how Bimeda can help 
find a contractor as well. Thank you, Jill. So final slide from me here, just a note to, to point to our website that's full of resources related to dipping, bymeda.co.uk forward slash take the plunge. Now, one of the fantastic tools that we do have on here is a map showing um, a number of mobile contract dippers that we are aware of that abide by the code of practice and do a fantastic job. And um, of course, there's no one that we can endorse as such. We're not directly affiliated with them. And what I would say is that there are also contractors that aren't necessarily on this list that we're not aware of. It doesn't necessarily mean that they won't do a good job if they're on this list. It just means that they're not here. Um, the key thing is to check that your contractor abides by the code of practice. We've discussed a little bit more about what good dipping practice looks like. So be around during the process, check. And as Jill said, if it's too good to be be true what they're offering then it, it probably is in reality too good to be true so thank you and at this point i'll hand back to kevin and leslie thank you rachel um we had some questions coming in here and um one of them is what products can be used for sheep showers jetta you probably um, might want to split that down into anti-parasiticides or um uh, other products. I don't know who wants to answer that. Um, best of, I, I'm happy yeah. to take that yeah. one, Kevin. So there are no veterinary medicines at all that are licensed for use in showers or dips. The only acceptable use for them is for colouring type products and um, nothing else. Thank you. Rachel, you said showers or dips. I think you mean showers Sorry, or jetters. Showers or jetters. Thank you for correcting. I think some of the complication comes, doesn't it, in that actually these bits of kit are out there. There's there's nothing to say say that can't buy, people can't buy these bits of kit, but there is nothing available, as Rachel says, to put through them. I think someone did mention maybe dyeing your sheep or bloom dipping your sheep, but I don't know if that would be very effective either. Um, uh, Brian, can you just explain a little bit how this is going to roll out? Is it sort of working now or is, is yeah. this paperwork out and for prescribers to use i think what we've done uh kevin is started this week with a press release and uh, spoke to the media so it'll be hitting the probably the farmer's guardian and farmer's weekly next week um, but it's something we'd like to start from straight away the, the code of practice is available on the websites of the organizations which are on this call today um, and then we will be uh, encouraging uptake across the industry. Uh, we certainly will be through the ARDA members and make sure prescribers are aware of the code of practice and put it into place straight away. Thank you. Um, um, John Millwood's put in the actual uh, Q&A section there um, from the VMD, John Millwood. Um, illegal or inappropriate prescribing supply or use of OP dips can be reported to the VMD here, and he's put a, put a link. Um, and this is the same message we get. You're getting from the distributor, from the prescriber, from the manufacturer, from the 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 NAC, um, and from Scotch. You know, this isn't. Everyone's in agreement in this. This is here to protect the product and try and uh, reduce scab or eliminate scab. Would be a wonderful thing to be able to say. Um, but uh, but you know, this is the same message being delivered. Um, so, uh, yeah, Leslie. I think, I mean, I was just going to say as well, you know, just to sort of, you know, I, I said about this more information on the SCOPS website, but just to remind people that, you know, we're not suggesting people go out and dip willy nilly because sheep scab is out there. This goes in with the other diagnostics that we've got. You know, we've now got a blood test which works really really well to identify when scab is there so you know it's it's being used we're not suggesting that everyone's going out and dip sheep just because they want to dip sheep um we are there's a lot of information out there as to how we do it how we coordinate it how we identify where it's needed um so you know just to encourage people to think in the wider context as well um that that this is part of that overall um uh, projects and, and attacks on scab really mm. Um, I'll just say at this point as well, because there are over 160 of you on the on the webinar today. Can you start typing in your um, Q, uh, your uh, SQP numbers now, uh, your and uh, your Rosa numbers, so that we know you've got to the end? Because there'll be quite a lot of typing going on. If you could add them, so uh, 
uh, so that we know you're still here. Um, is there anything else to add? Anyone want to add any more or any more questions to be asked? Uh, just to note from from me that we we've, we've done some preliminary communication with with uh, SQPs on on, uh, on our register, and I'll be in touch within a day or two with uh, with further information, uh, including the links that um, that have been provided today. Um, so if you haven't uh, yet seen the code of practice uh, from the information that uh, that's already been sent out, then um, watch watch your inbox in the in the next day or two from Amtra. Um, Sue's asked a question, will we have a leaflet to give to the farmers in store? Because that would be a good, you know, how are they going to get this message well, out? In I, the store? I mean, I think, I mean, the, the code of practice is as a PDF, so there's no reason why that code of practice can't be printed off and, and the form used in the appendix and so on. Um, you know, we won't be printing leaflets um, other than that, but it's there in a PDF format, uh, which is a friendly, print-friendly version, Jill, I think, isn't it? Um so, so yeah, you know, use that basically. Uh, and, and John Wilmore was just asking about the webinar. Yeah, the webinar will be available on the Scops YouTube channel and um, probably by the end of today, um, we hope. So it will be there for everybody. And we will be looking at a way to, to make that available for those who want to claim uh, amateur CPD points. But if people just want to watch it or direct farmer customers to it or whatever, then yes, the the, uh, the Scops YouTube channel uh, will be the way to go. But if you're wanting amateur CPD points, then uh, hang fire for a few days, please. Yeah, I think it'll be on the NSA channel as well. Um, and the actual code of practice is definitely available on the Scops website, and is it all available on everyone else's website? I would imagine or the link to it, and I think it's it's also been put in the in the chat. Um, how should be how should how should the dip be stored at the retailer, Stephen? Is that one for you? Well, in, in the same way as it would be, uh, you know, as it has been to date, really. Um, there's there's no change to that requirement. Um, the the all veterinary medicines in retailers have to be stored appropriately in, in, in approved premises that are inspected by VMD, uh, and that's still the case. Um, once up to seven days for consecutive use have been supplied to a contractor, then it needs to be uh, stored appropriately by the contractor, and, and, and that's touched on in the code of practice uh, as well. Uh, clearly, that's that's important, but the, 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 the volumes, if you like, are, are being stored uh, at, at the retailer level. Um, and yes, it's important that they're stored appropriately and safely. But, but nothing's changed in that sense. You want to add to that, Rachel? Yeah, I mean, not a great deal to add. I think just from the, in terms of keeping the medicine working well, store it below 25 degrees Celsius. So we don't want it ex exposed to extremes of temperature and also just keep it in a safe, dry place. So your usual storage conditions. Uh, we did have an inquiry recently about whether they need to be stored in bonded containers within the premises. Now, it's not a requirement to do that, of course, if you want to it's good practice and um, but there's no um legal requirement to have to do that right. um another one is there a government funded scheme in northern ireland for the use of dip disposal leslie would you no, the ends are um, I'll, I'm probably going to defer to okay. Rachel. I mean, it is quite difficult to work <laughs> out. Um, but Rachel, I think you probably are more up to speed with this one than I am. Yeah, so it would be DIRA that you have to reach out to. Um, my understanding is that you can apply to them for a permit to dispose of DIP. I don't believe there are costs associated, but I wouldn't be entirely sure on that front. Um, but again, it's your local devolved environment agency that is in control of the requirements for all DIP disposal. So they would be the first port of call. Um, we've answered about all our... Oh, another one. Uh, why isn't there one of these in England? Does come in. What are, what are we saying in terms of a, a government-funded... Yeah, it must be. Well, yeah. well, that's a very good question, but um, it would probably, yeah, there's a short answer or a long answer, but it's, uh, it, it, it's a nice wish, but it's not going to happen. Um and in Wales, it's even more expensive to dispose of dip. So, you know, each country is quite different. And I think what Rachel was saying, you know, it, depending on which devolved country you're in, you really do need to know what the rules are for yours because they are quite different and the costs are quite different, aren't they? 
And that is uh, slightly uh, one of the beauty of the code, the, the code of practice and using a mobile dipper. They're licensed and registered and they know where they can get rid of it. And, um, you know, or if you are, I guess you might be asking that question if you are a, a mobile dipper and you need to know where to get it. But, um, um, yeah. So why not license the contractor, show a certificate and put the responsibility on them for the amount of dip? This is a question from Stuart. Hmm. I'm not quite sure what what Stuart means in terms of, I mean, the, respons oh. the, the responsibility is on the contractor and within the code, what you'll find is that the, the, it says that the contractor and the farmer must agree beforehand who is going to be responsible for disposal of the dip. And it may well be that the contractor takes that responsibility and the farmer pays for that, of course, within the cost, or the farmer may have a license and he may choose to use that to dispose of. But, but it very clearly says in the code that you need to agree that beforehand as to who's responsible Responsibility it is to dispose. Um, we've got um, one here. Does the code apply to the Asnan dip only or to other OP dips? I assume you mean OP. There aren't any dip. other current any, any others, others currently licensed. There is still one within the VMD list, but currently not available on the market, and and, and as far as I know, is unlikely to be certainly in the foreseeable future. Has the disposal practice ever been considered as part of the prescribing process? Is, it, is there any questions in the um, code of practice on that, on the on the forms you fill in? Just an agreement. They just sign who's responsible, do they? Yeah, I think, um, and maybe someone else would like to jump in here, but um, from the prescribing perspective, um, while it's a good idea to talk it through and provide advice and refer them to the correct place, um, it isn't necessarily the, the onus on the prescriber legally to determine the means of disposal. Of course, it's still a good conversation to have. I, I agree with Rachel there. The, the disposal forms part of the code of practice and the contractor and the prescriber are signing to the, that they're agreeing to the code of practice, but it doesn't have to be a part of the uh, prescribing and supply process. Okay, thank yeah. you. I think that's a discussion between the farmer and the contractor, really, mm. who's taking responsibility for that. Okay. Well, um, there's not really any more questions coming in, and I think we've we've covered it very thoroughly. I would just like to thank you all for um, to attend for attending today and and um, take uh, well just being involved with your questions and taking it all in. Um, someone. Uh, that John's just had a really informative webinar and thank you all and I'd concur with that um, you know it is like I said at the start it is throughout the industry from dis distribution to to the end user the, the, the support for this is there and um, just trying to get on top of scab as well and doing the job properly so we can protect what we do have available to us so thank you all for joining and thank you all for our panelists uh, have a good day Thanks. Thank Bye now. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Bye now. Thank you.